Hello and welcome to the program, Sula's Big Adventures, with me, Sula. In today's episode, I'm going to be discussing how to plan for an observing session with your telescope or binoculars. How many times have you planned a night of stargazing only to have your plans dashed by a sudden storm, clouds moving in, blazing forest fire nearby, a pall of haze or fog parking over your house, the wind starting to gust at your observation site, the jet stream suddenly turning to land over the rooftop, Starlink deciding to parade overhead, the neighbor deciding to play basketball in his backyard with the help of an extremely bright light, friends or family who have no interest in astronomy showing up suddenly on your doorstep for an unexpected visit, or having too much homework or schoolwork or too much paid work to do and suddenly lost another precious night under the stars. Well, I'm sure we've all had these frustrating, unavoidable experiences, but don't let an avoidable experience ruin an observing session due to poor preparation or no preparation. I can't part the clouds for you or remove the smoky haze or get rid of that pesky neighbor, but what I can do is give you some excellent advice on how to best plan for the most successful and rewarding observing session you can get with your telescope or binoculars. I'll go over everything you need to do in order to be properly prepared for a wonderful and a fun evening under the stars. I'll discuss how to plan for a spontaneous observing session in your backyard or nearby, and also how to plan ahead for an observing session to a dark sky site you might want to visit. That requires a little more preparation, but no matter whether you plan to observe in your backyard or whether you plan to take your telescope to a dark sky site, you'll need to find out what is the weather. The first thing I do every morning while having my coffee is check the weather. For general weather, uh, which is frequently oh, wrong, yeah. I'll first check oh, weather.com. Yeah. It'll say yes. whether it's going to be clear or cloudy or rainy or snowing. And also, it'll tell you what time the sun will rise and set at your location or other locations that you've entered into your app. But for much more specific weather information, especially if I'm planning to drive to a dark sky site, I'll check the weather on an app such as Asteria or Clear Outside or Astropheric using the specific longitude and latitude for wherever I plan to observe. With these apps, you can not only check the weather to make sure it will be clear, which is essential, but you can also check on if there are if there's going to be wind, how's the transparency, and how's the seeing. You need to know about these factors too because they can severely impact your ability to see things in the night sky, even when it otherwise appears clear outside. For more information about seeing, you can see my video on atmospheric seeing. After checking the weather for your specific location or dark sky site, the next thing you're going to need to do is to see whether the moon is going to be out. Whether you plan on observing the moon or you don't want the moon to be interfering with your observation of deep sky objects, you need to know what the moon will be doing. You can find out the phases of the moon from many sources, news outlets, sky safari, sky and telescope, and many others. But I like to use a specific app on my phone called The Moon. It's a free app and it shows what the moon will look like that day and evening, how old the moon is, the percentage of illumination, what time it rises and what time it sets. And you can check far into the future too. And it has some other nice features, but these are the ones that I can check quickly at a glance. If you're planning on observing the moon, you'll need to know how many days old the moon is in order to see specific objects on the moon which are only visible on certain days. For observing the moon, you probably want more specific information about favorable librations or other things like that. But I'm going to focus on preparing for a night of observing deep sky objects and planets. So the app called the moon <laughs> gives me all the information that I'll need in order to 
prepare for a superb night of deep sky stargazing. So if the moon is at or near new moon, or it'll be setting reasonably early or very late, then I'm all set for a night of deep sky observing. And you can check all of these things in advance to plan for an upcoming observation session. Now that we've checked the weather, the cloud cover, transparency, seeing, and whether or not the moon will be visible, the next thing we need to do in order to be prepared is the most important, and that is to create an observing list. Your observing list is very personal to you and what you would like to see, but you must have one. There are many ways to create your observing list. Maybe you already have a list of things that you really want to see, or you've seen them before, but you'd like to see them better, or maybe you are trying to work on an observing program, but maybe you just have no idea where to start. Well, I can make some suggestions of where to start. You can follow along with Sue French's excellent book, Deep Sky Wonders, and just go to whatever month it is and follow along with her suggestions. But be modest and be realistic. Start with a list of maybe 10 objects because you'll want to study each one and take observing notes and maybe even sketch each object. But you definitely have to record each observation or you didn't see it, according to the Astronomical Society anyway. Another suggestion would be to follow along with Turn Left at Orion and just go to whatever season it is and pick about 10 objects from that book for your list. Or you can use Burnham's Celestial Handbook, which covers thousands of celestial objects. Another suggestion would be if you have Sky Safari, you can click on the button tonight at the bottom and you can see what planets would be visible that evening and also what deep sky objects are going to be visible and what time they rise and set. If any planets are visible, you can also check on Sky Safari to see if any of them will have satellites that you can see and whether there are any special events like a transit on Jupiter or an occultation or whether a planet is at opposition or an interior planet is at greatest elongation. And you can see if you want to add one of those items to your observation list. And Sky Safari allows you to make an event planner on their app. I've never used it, so I don't know how good it is. But you can make your own list from things that you just want to see. Maybe you read about a comet or an asteroid that's currently visible in the night sky. Or maybe you want to try to see a bunch of planetary nebulae and Cassiopeia that you read about in Sky and Telescope. Or maybe Vesta or Ceres are visible and you want to try to see those or try for Pluto. Another source for your list would be one of the lists in the Observer's Handbook such as the Deep Sky Challenge by Alan Dyer, or Deep Sky Gems by David Levy, or NGC Finest, or maybe you're just trying to make your way through the Messier catalog. But whatever source you use, whether it's an observing program, an ad hoc list, or your wish list, whatever your source, you need to create a list of objects. And I would say limit it to 10, especially if you'll be using a manual mount and locating each object on your own because that's going to take a lot of time. Now you're ready to make your list. I always make my list on a piece of paper and you can make it digitally if you want. Um, there's even a program available to plan your observing session called Deep Sky Planner developed by Phyllis Lang of Nightwear and you can purchase it for 75 US dollars. It has a huge database of objects and you can save your sites or you can add new sites and it has many other features besides just allowing you to create your own observing list. I haven't used it but it was showcased recently by the Journal of the Royal Astronomical Society and it looks like it's well worth the $75. But if you use this software or you make your list digitally, be sure to take your laptop with you to your observation site. Your list should include the object, the name, and the location. And during the day, you should locate the object from your list on your star chart or stellarium or whatever you use for locating. And your list should also include 
the type of object, its size, and its luminance or magnitude. And if your list includes some faint, difficult to see objects, you may want to consult some sources in advance to determine the best eyepiece to use, the best exit pupil, and whether a filter is needed. And make sure the object is actually visible with whatever aperture telescope you're going to be using and that it's visible at the time you plan to observe. Your star chart isn't going to give you this information. You can consult calculators such as the IP software by Steve Waldy that I mentioned in my video on exit pupils or the contrast calculator. And some books will also tell you all this information. There's the Observer's Sky Atlas by Eric Karkocha, which will give you all of or most of that information, but it only covers 500 objects. A more comprehensive book, but much more expensive, is Interstellarium Deep Sky Atlas by Ronald Stoyan. Or you can look up each object on the internet and see if you can find out the minimum aperture telescope or binoculars needed and recommended filters. Now that you have your wish list of objects you want to see in this observing session and you check the weather and conditions, now you're ready to compile all the things that you'll need, especially if you're going to be traveling with your telescope to a dark sky site. So many times I've gone to a dark sky site and I have to drive far to get to a dark sky site. And then I realized I forgot something that I really needed. And so recently, I've been keeping everything in my car. Two telescopes, three mounts, a chair, a table, a star chart, a bag of eyepieces, filters, wrenches, um, dew shield, hand warmer, extra thermal top, thermal bottom, heavy overcoat, hats, gloves, warmers, warm boots, you name it, it's in my car. But if you don't want to do that, and I can understand why, <laughs> make sure you gather everything that you'll need and take it with you. And make sure you have your telescope mount and a battery to power your mount if it's needed, any cables that you need, your star chart, your chair, a red light, or maybe two, eyepieces, filters, table, log book, sketch pad, and pencils, and laptop if you have a digital observing list or plan to use your computer to locate objects or take pictures. And most importantly, be sure to bring your written observing list in case of electronic failure. On the day you plan to observe, avoid looking at any bright lights. Don't go to the beach that day. If possible, wear an eye patch over your dominant eye and make sure your telescope is well collimated and clean your optics. Now you've arrived at your dark sky site or you walked outside to your patio. Now it's time to relax and take your time with each object and study it and don't be in a rush. Take notes and sketch the object in your logbook and be sure to make a notation of the sky conditions, transparency and seeing at a minimum. Note the optics used and the eyepieces and or any filters you use for each object. And for each object, note the shape, the size, the brightness. For nebulae, were you able to see any stars inside? For star clusters, could you resolve individual stars? Did it have an obvious core? How many stars can you see? Was there a specific part where the stars were more concentrated? For planetary nebulae, could you see the disk? Was it defined or diffuse? And was there any color? And could you see the central star? For double stars, note the position and separation and colors. But don't forget to take your time with each object. And don't rush and be patient and spend some time with each object. And most of all, have fun. Now let me summarize all the things that I've covered and the necessary preparation you'll need to have an enjoyable time under the stars. Number one, check the weather and conditions. Make an observing list with details for each object. Number three, organize everything you'll need and take it with you if traveling. Number four, avoid looking at any bright objects. The weather is terrible. Number five, 
properly dark enough to your eyes before him, but definitely once you get to the observing site. Number six, collimate your telescope if necessary in advance and let it cool down and your eyepieces before starting the observing session. And make sure that your optics are clean. And number seven, keep detailed notes and a sketch if possible of each observation. And number eight, last but not least, have fun. That's it for now. I hope you found this presentation useful. So long till next time. Dark skies forever. Sula, signing off.